individual, but through a rehabilitative technique. And it needs to be done in the home. It needs to be done with no additional people around. It needs to be done in, in a, a few hours a week. And it needs to have dramatic benefits across multiple domains. It's not enough to give you recovery. Not good enough. Okay? It needs to give you multiple benefits, including exercise. You know, it's amazing that in the Surgeon General's 2010 report um, that they emphasize the need for exercise in every human being and that it's a state of emergency in the United States because up to 60% of individuals are sedentary. And they go on to, to focus a whole um, subsection on disabilities and the extra need for exercise. They go on to emphasize the concept that although some physiology changes as a result of injury, the basic principles of exercise physiology are largely remain intact. So the thousands of studies that have been done with exercise, placebo controlled, randomized trials, in able-bodied individuals apply to those with disabled. Okay. And I don't want to see a scientist spending their time looking at physical outcomes, because that's already proven. That's already proven, you know. Um, it is so well proven that, you know, shame on us, that we don't offer exercise to people with paralysis. Almost no center does this. You know, centers like the Miami Project and others, there's, there's a handful that do it. And, and they're the real pioneers, you know. But it's, it, you know, I use their word loosely because Every place should do this. I mean, it's just ridiculous that we don't have this. But, it, you know, um, the Miami Project is a place that could do it because they're very effective and efficient in multiple areas, including bringing in money. It's very costly uh, to do these kinds of things in a center. It's very costly to the individual coming down for the therapy. Nobody can come down to a center three times a week for the rest of their life. It's hard enough for us to do it and for me to do it. But with a disability, it's just not possible. So, you know, long-term exercise has to be done at all. And there's virtually no equipment designed to do this. And, you know, many individuals with paralysis want to exercise, but how can you exercise if you can't move? Okay, will you get the benefits of exercise substantially if, if you have a robot that moves your limbs? Absolutely not. If I took any one of the able-bodied people in this room and stuck them in a robot for an hour a day, every day, they'd wither away. Because you need volitional force, you have to contract that muscle against force. You need to do it for a sufficient amount of time. You know, a half hour, three times a week isn't good enough. There's hundreds of papers that demonstrate that. You know, there's a threshold, there's a, a, a physiologic response. There's an amount of power or force that's required to get these benefits. These benefits are different for building muscle mass or for building bone um, or for offsetting things. Um, and uh, as I'll tell you really briefly, the same things are important for the nervous system. And this shouldn't be surprising. Activity has been so well demonstrated for every, almost every mechanism in the nervous system during development of the nervous system. It's astounding. If you disrupt activity in, a, in, in say, a, a, a baby that's six months into the, its, its pregnancy, and you reduce activity in that infant's nervous system to the degree which activity is reduced in the spinal cord below the level of an injury, in someone living with a spinal cord injury, you will get major deformation of, of the nervous system and a disastrous inhibition of development. Okay. And adding back activity prevents that. And what we've discovered is the same thing applies to the nervous system of an adult after an injury. And patterned activity in the neural circuits is critical for maintenance of the system and to promote the body's own ability to micro repair. One of the big changes in the last 10 years is our understanding that surprisingly, and I say that facetiously, 
that the nervous system appears in, in part to turn over, just like every other organ in your body. So your skin turns over. You know, that's why when someone gets radiation, it, it prevents all cell birth. First your skin sloughs off, your GI tract sloughs off first. And you know, those cells have to be replaced every you know, three or four days. Um, it was only recently that it was discovered that heart tissue turns over because that was believed not, not to be the case. Brain and heart were the two organs that, where the cells were not constantly turning over. Now we understand in heart that that's not longer the case. There's also a sufficient amount of evidence now in the nervous system that that's the case. Certainly for glial cells, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. Astrocytes turn over on the order of, of, of months to a year. There's less data, but, but you can make an inference with oligodendrocytes as well, um, that uh, they also turn over on the order of years to decades, depending on the cell type, type of oligodendrocyte and the tract that it's in. If you measure cell birth in the nervous system, it's amazing how many new cells are being born in, in an adult nervous system. And about 4% of those cells go on to replace cells that are lost. We also understand that neurons turn, that new neurons are added in at least two brain regions, in the hippocampus and the dentate and the olfactory. Don't be surprised that neurons are added in other brain regions. It's very predictable. But it's not going to be occurring in, in a matter of days. Our techniques and our approaches are limited to measuring things that happen in days and months. But if something takes a year to occur in a rat, we'll never detect it because we can't study it. No one can keep a rat around long enough and pay for the cost at $1.50 a day in a cage. Um, you know, so there's a series of things. So again, yesterday's principles and techniques of rehabilitation today applied difference in time, space, and rationale. So we're doing these ABRT therapies for two reasons. To promote the, the physical integrity of the body to the benefits of exercise. And if we can only do one thing, let's do the one thing that gets the maximal benefit. You gotta get a cardiovascular workout. And let's work most of the muscles in the body. It's so predictable. Spinal cord injury, you develop diabetes and you develop enhanced cardiovascular risk factors. That's, you don't even need to do the studies because <coughs> that was predictable based on exercise physiology. If you, if you basically lose half the muscles in your body, your legs are over half the muscles in your body, you don't metabolize glucose properly. If you add that muscle back, you metabolize glucose properly. So people with spinal cord injury develop glucose intolerance and then early diabetes, major confounding problem. And you know, in the peripheral nervous system, development of diabetes dramatically impairs repair of the nervous system and probably even maintenance of the nervous system. So these factors aren't just a medical problem, but they directly impact someone's recovery and maintenance of recovery. And don't forget that the minute you have an injury, you, don't, you start undergoing accelerated aging, right? And studies have already shown that reduced activity causes accelerated aging in multiple organs. Okay? And that's also in Healthy People's 2010 report. So um, all of these things impact what we do. So before I begin my talk, I better disclose uh, that some of the stuff I'm going to show you, um, and I'll have to do it pretty briefly, um, 